Text number 12. <clears throat> Thus far in chapter 4, it's interesting because in a lot of ways we're still in the pre-theistic section of the Gita. So we're getting lessons that would be considered like Buddhism or like Stoicism. Um, you know, maybe like something Oprah would say or Eckhart Tolle would say. Good generic spiritual advice. But very much like something you might get in a fortune cookie at a Chinese vegan restaurant. Be indifferent to pleasure and pain. Things come and go. Don't be attached to the results. You find these lessons in a, a wide variety of traditions. And they get you know, presented perennially <clears throat> by different philosophers. And they're so standard that they're cliche. Um, just because something's cliched doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad. You could say this whole you need oxygen to, to breathe thing is so cliche. Everybody says it. But the fact that everybody thinks you need oxygen to breathe, that you can't breathe underwater, that gravity will affect you if you jump off a building, doesn't indicate those things aren't true. It just indicates that they're so true and so obviously true and so incorrigibly true and so demonstrably true and so foundationally true and so empirically verifiably true that everybody knows them. And so just because something's cliche doesn't mean that necessarily it's cool to believe the opposite thing. Oh, yeah, everybody believes that if you jump off a building, you'll die. So I think if you jump off a building, you'll live. And I'm going to prove that I'm punk rock and I'm a rebel. And I'm going to do the opposite of what everybody knows is true. <clears throat> so for the most part, in the first few chapters of the Gita, Krishna's given us something which is you know, it's it's a bit more than what you might get from a um, fortune cookie, obviously. It's more than you might you would get from a one-liner divination style, cold read style tradition. Um, but it's roughly equivalent to what you get if you were to read a really good Buddhist text some really good sata literature. Maybe it's a little less um, enigmatic and a little more easy to understand, but it's the same kind of stuff. It's the same kind of stuff you get if you read Stoic philosophers, if you read Seneca or something like that. Um, and then this fourth chapter starts to really step away from that generic teaching. It steps away from that generic teaching be because of one thing. There's one thing it does that's different than what you would get from Stoicism or from Buddhist teaching. There's something that happens in this fourth chapter that distinguishes it from everything I've just said that the Gita has in common with all these other traditions, there's one thing that it does in this fourth chapter which is distinct. What is it, Dhruv? Krishna begins to identify himself as God incarnate, as a personal deity that you can have a relationship with. At that point, we have segued 
we almost transported ourselves out of Buddhism and Stoicism. Or, you know, Taoism. Um, and we are now way more similar to Christianity or Islam. Because you've got this deity. Now you could say it's similar to polytheism, Babylonian or Egyptian religion. Or <clears throat> um, or the equivalents in Europe. And, you know, anywhere in the ancient world. But Krishna begins to identify himself as the supreme being, as the one without a second. And so now we're way more in the arena of Christianity or, or Islam, perhaps Judaism, depending on the variety of Judaism you subscribe to. That's a big shift. And there's been some foreshadowing, but it, it hits pretty quickly and pretty heavily in this fourth chapter. And so now we're not dealing with merely a Stoic style text, a Buddhist style text, a transcendentalist style text a text which teaches detachment and the temporary nature of the world. Allah Confucius or, or whoever. But now we're in a, a serious theological text which is identifying that there is in fact a personal supreme being that has been the genesis of the cosmos. Which makes great sense because we're individuals, we're persons, and how would our source not be personal and give rise to persons? If you accept the irreducibility of consciousness, then the necessity of the deity being conscious becomes obvious and uh, indisputable. That's why we spend so much time on arguing for the fundamental ontological status of consciousness because it's a real quick jump to God from there. How does, how do you, how, do, how does essential consciousness arise from something that has no consciousness? The only way you can say that is if consciousness is derivative and made up of simpler parts and can be broken down and built up out of simpler parts like any principle of emergentism. Without that, if consciousness is truly basic, then the source of consciousness would have to also be basic, just like the fundamental forces of physics have to be represented in the singularity. The fundamental particles of physics have to be represented in the singularity. So we're into a, a, a personal God quick in the fourth chapter. We've been circling the drain, so to speak, up till the fourth chapter, but when the fourth chapter hits, we are now dealing with a supreme being, and we're far away from Buddhism, far away from Taoism, far away from Stoicism, and we're, we're really close to Christianity, albeit a much cooler version, in my humble opinion. And then Krishna hits us with this, just with that in mind, with that introduction in mind. Let's, let's look back now. We just finished a real heavy theological section about how as you approach Krishna, he'll reciprocate with you and everyone's looking for him, everyone's following his path. And then the next verse. Kangshanta karmanam sidhim yajanta iha devataha. They worship 
in this world many gods desiring success in their actions desiring the successful completion of their actions. They worship many gods in this world. Kshipram hi manushe loke. Quickly, certainly in this world of men, success is born from that action of worshiping the other gods. So, People in this world, they worship gods wanting to des- enjoy success in all their endeavors. And quickly, in this world, you will get success in your endeavors by such things. Did you follow that? A little thing you got to think about here. It says success is born of karma. Success is born of karma could be that you can enjoy the world by the sweat off your own back. That we live in a functionally atheistic world and if you do the work you get the result. But because it's linked to this idea of worshiping the gods, desiring success in your acts, then there's this idea that that success is also coming from those gods who've been worshipped. So there's, let me just say it again. Look at the page of the book while we while we read. It says here, Kangshanta Karmanam Siddhim, desiring success in their actions. Success in their actions. Yajanta, they worship. Iha, in this world, Devataha, the gods. Do you follow that? Kshipram, hi manushe loke. Quickly, in this world of men, quickly in this world of men, Siddhi Bhavati Karmaja. Success is born from that work. So, is the work that gives rise to success you doing your duty? Or is the work that gives rise to success your worshiping of God's desiring success? You follow? You could go either way. A more literal thing would be that, you know, it would be two unconnected ideas. You're worshiping the God's desiring success, and quickly in this world, if you do work, you'll get success. But contextually, because we just talked about worshiping God's to achieve success, and now we're talking about achieving success, what's being said here is that you'll get success from worshiping other gods. It'll make your life in this world easy. You light a candle or you say a prayer and you get, get what you want. That's contrastable to what just was said before, that as you surrender to me, I reward you, and everyone's following my path. And so now Krishna's contrasting the monotheistic worship of him to the polytheistic worship of many gods. The monotheistic worship of him which is governed by surrender, prapadyante, they approach me, they surrender to me, versus worshiping other gods to get something material. Did you follow it? There's a contrast. The last verse we thought finished, then this verse. There's a little contrast. There's a contrapositioning of worship of many gods, worship of a single god. Worship of many gods is for people who have material desires. Worship of a single god is you don't have those material desires. So there's a, there's, a, there's a contrast being set up, a dichotomy that's being set up. Sometimes people will say, well, what if you worship Shiva? You're a Shiva Bhakta. Or you worship Devi. Well, if you worship Devi, you're not a Bhakta, you're a Shakta. That's the name for worshiping a Devi. And if you worship Shiva, you're not a Bhakta, rather you are a Shaiva. And because the worshippers of Devi and the worshippers of Shiva do not believe that Shiva or Devi really exists in the ultimate issue because they're impersonalists who believe everything ultimately merges into the one. And therefore there is no eternal place where you worship Shiva forever. 
when we contrast the worship of Krishna slash Vishnu to the worship of the other Vedic gods or Hindu gods, Vedic gods is more like Agni and Vayu and, and, and uh, Indra. Um, and then, you know, the Hindu deities is more Ganesh, Shiva. Rudra's there in the Vedic pantheon. But, you know, you get into the later Sanskrit literature, the Puranic literature, essentially. Also, to some extent, the Mahabharata, what have you. Um, but primarily the Puranas. You get into that literature and you get Ganesh, Shiva, uh, Devi become real popular. There's a, there's a Sri Sukta. There's old Vedic hymns to the goddess. But not exactly the way the goddess is conceived of in, you know, the last few thousand years of Hinduism. It's kind of an older, more um, archetypal worship. Vishnu is there at the beginning. And there's not even that many prayers to Vishnu in the old Vedas, but those prayers to Vishnu in the old Vedas are bhakti. They're, they're talking to a singular deity. Uh, when Max Mueller, the famous German Indologist, he uh, coined a term, cathanotheism, to point out that henotheism is, you know, uh, there may be many deities, but our tribe worships this one. And then there's monolatry. Monolatry is there's many deities, perhaps, but there's only one supreme deity worthy of adoration, worthy of worship. That term was coined to describe Judaism by academics. Because as I mentioned last week, it appears that Judaism acknowledged other gods. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It does seem to indicate that there are other gods. Um, anyway, when Max Mueller read the Vedas, he got confused because each hymn in the old Vedas seemed to be arguing that Agni or Vayu or Indra was the supreme being. It's a, it's a, a common thing you find. In, if you talk to an Indian person, oftentimes they'll say, oh, this is my brother. I think it happens in the Near East as well. You see Muslims doing it as well. And sometimes you'll ask, is this actually your brother? Or this is my cousin. They oftentimes they'll say in India, this is my cousin or my uncle or my aunt. And you'll say, is it actually your aunt or your uncle? And they'll say, because pretty soon they're introducing you to you know, half their village is their aunt or their uncle. And you start to wonder if there's some kind of Hatfield and McCoy kind of hillbilly inbreeding type thing going on or what's the deal because everybody seems to be related to everybody and then they'll say no 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 I, it's like my you know my, my cousin brother oh he's your cousin no no I, you know, like in our village relationship he's my cousin brother and so then it means that they grew up together they went to the same school they played each other's houses their family their parents are friends and they're and then they'll say oh this is my best friend and pretty soon, you get just like 10 best friends. This is my best friend, my best friend, my best friend. And, um, but, and so it's, it's very strange for someone from the West where those terms are used in a different context to mean exclusively. It's very much like our exclusivist religion in the West, Christianity, you're either heathen or you're a Christian. You're either a goyim or you're a Jew. You're either an infidel or you're a Muslim. And you're either in or you're out. And you're either in my tribe or out of my tribe. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. And so it's a real dualistic worldview. So when somebody doesn't have that worldview, is, and, and, that, and that works even beyond religion, just living in, you know, in, in the, the desert, in the, in the Middle East, I'm living in the desert. Resources are scarce, and so you've got to fight for resources, and people are either your enemies or your friends, and 
it's a hard struggle for existence amongst the Bedouins and what have you. And so um, it makes sense to have a worldview that's real clean and black and white. In these great civilizations like China, great civilizations like... Uh, Pelon, come this way, man. Go over that way. So you're not sitting right behind the camera. Thanks. Uh, in these great civilizations like China and India, people got along a lot better, so they became much more tolerant because they lived in these great civilizations which were not constantly fractured by civil war and there weren't discrete kingdoms and people did liaise with one another philosophically, religiously, but also just in terms of living together in a great civilization where there was a lot of continuity. As such, they had to figure out a way to get along, much like our states get along with the federal government. And some stuff's left up to the Fed, and some stuff's adjudicated on the state level. And so, you know, you... Um, you find a lot more brotherhood or uh, appreciation of the other perspective in Hinduism even incorporating of other traditions into one's own. Very common on a Hindu altar, if there's a large Christian component in that area, they might throw Jesus up on their altar next to Durga and Ganesh. I'll put a picture of Jesus up there, why not? Sure. Depending, you know, depending on the... Yeah, you say that's, that's all. Yeah, everybody, everybody can get some. No problem. You know, because we're, we're an equal opportunity employer. There, there's, a, there's a value placed on that. So anyway, Max Mueller reading the Vedic text, which in this way, in a sense, we're, we're very Hindu. When you read the Vedic text, it would, it would be a prayer to Agni, and it would say, Agni is the greatest. Agni is the origin of all. Then you read the text about Vaya. Vaya was the greatest. Vaya is the origin of all. Then you read the text uh, you know, about whatever deity it was. And it would say, These are the greatest. They're the, the origin of all. And he coined a new term called Cathanotheism, which is this one-at-a-time deity. Each one is worshipped as being the supreme when they're worshipped, as if there's no other deity and they're the supreme. He hadn't found that in any other religious text. So there was this, this Hanotheism where there may be different deities, but our tribe worships this deity. There was a monology, there's many different deities, but there's only one that's truly worthy of worship. Then he came up with this cathanotheism, this one at a time deity, where each one was worshipped as if they were supreme. Because he couldn't deal with the Indianness of the Vedic text that he was reading, which I, you find is actually, it's still very much the way Indian culture and, and, and Near East culture, Central Asian culture, um, uh, presents itself even now, both on a secular level as well as on a, on a religious level. Um, so you get this happening in the Gita repeatedly, and this happens in the Jewish text, and this happens in the Christian text as well, where there is a, a distinction made between the pagan deities of the Romans and Jesus, between Yahweh and the Baals and Ishtars, of, you know, of, of the Babylonian culture that Judaism was thriving within or you know, was, give, was given birth to within that larger culture. And it came up as a, a reaction or an outgrowth. And so you see this tension between monotheism, one god, and polytheism, many gods. And there's a number of different strategies employed for how to put forward the idea that one god is better than many gods. You see that perennial debate playing itself out on the pages of the Gita, and in fact, this is probably the first place where it's rigorously done. And Krishna's contrasted approaching him to, well, if you want to enjoy, then you'll approach the many gods to try to enjoy, and then you'll get what you want. But eventually Krishna said, but you're doing it wrong. And ultimately, whatever they give you comes from me. And ultimately, they can't give you liberation. And ultimately, they're for people who are, 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 are materialistic and have material desires. Or, in contrast, for people who are impersonalists. 
and desire to merge and give up their individuality. Therefore, there will be no need. Therefore, there will be no need to worship God in perpetuity because God doesn't exist in perpetuity. God exists as a distinct reality in this world where you may engage in devotion, but at the higher echelons of spiritual practice, you realize that you are functionally one with the deity and there's no need to worship the deity anymore. In fact, at the highest level, the distinction between you and the deity melts away and you literally become one with God. Not figuratively one in love, one in purpose, one in desire, but literally you become one with everything and you lose your individuality as the last stage of liberation. At the last stage, you give up your individuality. If you give up your individuality, then there's no meaning to eternal devotion, eternal love, and eternal heaven where you serve in perpetuity. There's no meaning to any of that stuff. So when we say, you know, we contrast within Hinduism the worship of Shiva or the worship of Devi to the other main form of worship, by far the largest, the worship of Vishnu, 75 plus percent of Hindus are Vaishnavas. The other, you know, whatever it is, 25 percent, 23 percent, I think, 22 percent are spread out amongst the Shaivas and the, and the Shaktas, the worshippers of Devi and the worshippers of, of uh, Shiva. But it's not just that, oh, you know, my God has snakes, your God has a flute. My God's female, your God's male slash female. It's not just that. It's not just that there's different details within the iconography. It's not that just there's different stories associated with those deities. One of them is a monotheistic singularity creator being who is the source of all reality. The other ones are evolutes from the one that ultimately merge back into the one and don't represent a concrete locus of devotion forever. Therefore, although we may both do kirtan, we both may both chant japa, we may both make offerings, we may look similar in our worship. At the end of the day, when you look at the theological texts of the Shaivas, you know, all the way up uh, um, to Trika Shaivism up in Kashmir, and all the way down to Shaiva Siddhanta in Sri Lanka and everywhere in between. When you look at the texts that those traditions hold dear, you find that their conception is impersonalism. Therefore, their deity is not truly a monotheistic deity. Therefore, we're comparing apples to oranges or apples to rocks as opposed to apples to apples. It's a categorically different conception of divinity. It's a demiurge. It's a temporary manifestation for the purpose of giving you a springboard. And whatever devotion you have isn't really real. Um, the distinction would be if you were married, if you were married, and your intention was to stay married till the day you died, versus if you met a person at the bar and you were engaging in some kind of role-playing game for that night where you were pretending to be married, but you had every intention at the end of the night to go your own separate ways and never talk to them again. And you, you, you were having some kind of a girlfriend experience. But there was no intention of being with that person forever. Rather, you were enjoying the, the game and it, you thought there was some value in the aesthetic of role playing as boyfriend and girlfriend or husband and wife for a day with every intention that at the end of that night you would you know, leave some money on the dresser and walk out and never look back. Did you follow that? That sounds like a really grotesque uh, analogy However, it's a weak analogy because it doesn't go anywhere near far enough. Because even in a marriage, there's the idea that you could theoretically get divorced or you're married until death do you part. When we're talking about devotee and the way they feel about the deity, it's an eternal devotion that they feel lasts forever, for billions and trillions and eternity, infinity. 
And so comparing one night to a lifetime is nothing. What is that? It's say 10,000 to one or something like that or whatever it comes out to, right? 20,000 to one if you're married 60, 50, 60 years. But this is, this is not that. This is infinity to 50 years. It's, there's no comparison. It's not 20,000 times. It's not 2 billion times. It's not a Google time. It's not 2 Google times. It's unlimited compared to something incredibly finite. So the, the uh, analogy seems sordid and also derogatory it's really a weak analogy because it doesn't anywhere near go far enough to communicate the distinction between the impersonalist who engages in bhakti-esque type activities and the actual bhakti who engages in perpetual devotion and what the Gita teaches is this perpetual devotion option which makes it really similar to a Christianity or an Islam maybe Christianity isn't so philosophically astute Maybe it's not so workable and coherent in terms of things like an eternal hell or, you know, a devil or one lifetime and you go to hell forever and exclusivism. There might be a, a number of flaws, fundamental philosophical flaws with Christianity, but at least in the idea that there's a source of all reality, that one they got right. You're seeing this begin to play out in this verse. And so you could take a real literal reading and not read it in relationship to the last verse and just say, oh, he's just making a statement that born of your acts is success. But because it's being linked to the worship of many gods and the worship of many gods in the Gita is about people who are materialistic, who have a cheap devotion and they just want things in this world and they're, they're begging these things from God the same way you might beg them from a parent or the same way you might beg them from a, you know, a boss or a, a, a representative of the law, some kind of authority figure, but you've still got all your material desires. You're just trying to use them to get what you want. Um, uh, that's what's being described here about the devotees of the demigods. And the followers of Krishna are being contrasted to that in this eternal, perennial devotion that's therapeutic and prophylactic and it's purifying and it, it sanitizes you and wipes away all of your misgivings and it becomes a supreme form of bhakti that lasts forever. So when we say, oh, you know, you're not a real bhakta, you're worshipping Shiva, you're not a real bhakta, you're worshipping Devi, we're not just insulting them because they're from the other camp we're actually making a theological critique. And they might say, well, I believe that, you know, Shiva exists forever. Then we, we just say, well, where'd you get that from? Because you've now broken from your own tradition. Like, fair enough. If you want to borrow my stuff. You know, it's like if I was, if somebody, if I was, if Christian was going to go, oh, you know, you have to accept Jesus. And I was going, you know, I, I accept a guy named Fred. And they're like, well, who's Fred? I'm like, Fred died on a cross for my sins. And, washed away the sins, sins of man with his blood and, and, and granted everyone um, redemption and made possible for everyone salvation and had an apostolic succession and it rose after three days from the dead and, and eventually, you know, after 50 days, uh, performed the Pentecost and transferred his um, uh, charisma to his followers who then wrote down the story of his life and times. And I began to describe, you know, a kind of a Nicene Creed type version of Christianity and I just swapped out the word Jesus for the word Fred. Okay, fine. A rose by any of the name smells as sweet. If you want to functionally be a Hare Krishna and then just say Shiva, I'm cool with that. But now you're my follower. You're my disciple. And I got to ask the question, why are you taking so much from our tradition but just swapping out the name? What's wrong with you to do that? That's weird. I think likely you have some kind of a mental disorder or a colossal ego 
and you have to beg and bite the hand that feeds you. And you, ha you arbitrarily reject a small thing, but you accept the mainstay of my tradition. Why not just accept the whole thing? What's the logic by which you take 99% of our theology and then swap out one word? And say you're with that group when you're, you've broken from that group, clearly. Theologically, you've broken from that group. You're with our group theologically. And you just borrow their word. What's the need for that syncretism? What's the need for that you know, cheesy eclecticism? What are you doing? You're just trying to be cool? That's going to probably severely impact your ability to achieve self-realization. If you're going to borrow 99.9% .9 of my tradition, why not just go the extra 0.1% and call God Krishna? Why not just put a ring on it? Or explain to me the logic by which you've borrowed everything and just rejected this one little thing to be different and a little emo, a little punk rock. Do you follow this argument? This is big stuff. This, is, this happens all over the world. Monotheism interfaces with polytheism, grows out of polytheism, is a, another option within a polytheistic society. It distinguishes itself from polytheism. Not always by just denying everything else exists, but rather by pointing to all the good stuff that's there in that other thing, it's there in this one supreme thing, and the things you're missing are also there. And it's an argument for completeness, usually. You don't have to go the other route of we're good, you're evil. You can go the route of you're good and we're better. <laughs> you're better and we're best. You've got A, B, and C, and we've got A, B, and C, and D. And it becomes an argument for completeness. Where you don't have to decry somebody else's realizations, you just show that yours is more complete, therefore yours is more true, therefore yours wins. It's a grand unified field theory as opposed to a, a radical dualism of good versus evil, God versus Satan, heaven versus hell, it becomes more how much can you explain? Can you explain quantum mechanics and classical mechanics? Can you explain everything, a, feel, a theory of everything? Then you win the day because you can incorporate everything within the manifest world within your theory, within your simple theory, and that means your theory carries more water than the one next door that can't account for certain things. Pandini, the great Sanskrit grammarian, came up with this meta rule that a later uh, rule supplants a former one, and it led to a bunch of inconsistencies when reading his grammar. And just recently, a guy from Cambridge um, said, no, 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 it wasn't a later rule supersedes a former one, it was a later rule it applies to the end of a word, and the earlier rule applies to the beginning of a word. And it was talking about within a word when you are conjugating and declining, when you're doing inflection on a word, that's what the later and former rule applies to. And this is a huge thing because it resolved a number of thorny issues in studying Sanskrit grammar that have been plaguing grammarians for 2,500 years. And this adjustment, all of a sudden, now there weren't any more mistakes being made. And and the, 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 the grammar that Panini wrote, kind of the first great grammar of the world, really, that's it's become a model for studying all other languages, where you put your tongue and the different places in your mouth and the stops you create and aspiration versus non-aspirated sounds and voice versus unvoiced sounds, all that stuff, syllabants versus fricatives and stuff like that. It's, it's all, it all came from Panini. And... Uh, um, and this, this recent, just in the last few months, realization took the world of Sanskrit by storm. It's a huge, big idea because it resolves a number of big problems that were there in the formal study of Panini's grammar as a complete system. And so sometimes you find a missing element to a teaching and that missing little ingredient, that small little piece, the whole thing fits together. It changes everything you build something and there's a piece missing, you're like, uh-oh, 
you know, take it all apart, you figure out where that piece goes and everything. You're all, oh, now I get it. Monotheism's like that. It's an argument for a more complete worldview. So anyway, Prabhupada's translation. Men in this world desire success and further activities, and therefore they worship the demigods. Quickly, of course, men get results from fruitive work in the world. Do you guys follow that? In Prabhupada's translation, it's interesting with Prabhupada's translation. Foolish people worship the demigods because they want immediate results. They get the results but do not know that the results so obtained are temporary and are meant for less intelligent persons. So Prabhupada, in his purport, goes with the version that you're worshiping the demigod to win, and then you win in this world, but you're not doing it right, versus the longer, more effective, ultimately, route of turning towards God and purifying yourself and realizing you have nothing to do with this world. But his translation, he doesn't connect the worship of demigods to the success. Quickly men get results from fruit of work in this world. So it seems that the two lines are distinct from one another in this translation, but in the purport he merges them together. This is a little bit... This is like a junior high school, high school level thing. I think up until this point I've been trying to teach you guys stuff that's at a grade school level. It's really simple. If you're paying attention, you should follow it. The point I just made requires a high school level of intelligence and focus, really. You all have the intelligence. Let's do it again. Try to follow this time. We're reading the Sanskrit, and the Sanskrit says, look at the Sanskrit with me. Kangshanta karmanam siddhim yajanta iha devataha. Desiring success in karma, they worship in this world many gods. Consider that to be a complete sentence in and of itself with no relationship to the subsequent sentence. It's talking about worshiping many gods. Next sentence, no relation to the first one. Shipram iha manushe loke. Quickly in this world of men, success is born from karma. Doing your duty. Success is born from you doing your duty. Does that have anything to do with God? No. Does that have anything to do with gods? No. It's just a general statement about doing your duty in this world. Buddhistic, stoic, atheistic, really. You follow? Read Prabhupada's translation. Men in this world desire success and further activities, and therefore they worship the demigods. End of the sentence. Next sentence has nothing to do with the first sentence. Quickly, of course, men get results from fruit of work in this world. Does that second sentence have anything to do with gods or worshiping gods? No, it's totally distinct. You follow? You have a, a statement about polytheism, and you have another statement about straight atheistic work ethic. You got it? Now go down to the bottom of the page, first paragraph, towards the bottom. However foolish people, Kritagyana, do you see that? However foolish people worship demigods because they want immediate results, they get the results, but they not know the results. So obtained are temporary and are meant for less intelligent persons. You see that? That links the getting of the results in the second sentence to the worship of the demigods in the first sentence. Prabhupada gives two different translations of this. He gives the literal translation in the straight translation. He gives a more contextual translation in the purport. The contextual translation is supported by the last verse, which talks about the worship of God. The contextual translation merges those two sections together, even though it's not literally done in the, in the words, it's implied. Do you guys follow that? You guys get that? This would be exegetics. This is we're now unpacking a text. We're looking at it carefully. We're looking at the language. And we're figuring out what's being intended. What's likely being intended. You can get real specific. The word... The word Siddhim is used in both. <clears throat> the word karma is used in both lines. Therefore, they're meant to be connected. 
The previous verse talked about monotheistic worship. This verse talks about polytheistic worship. Other verses in the Gita support that demigods do give temporary results. Krishna never recommends just winning by the sweat off your own back. He always recommends being tethered to a higher power. And in this case, the higher power is a demigod. And you give evidence for why this is what's intended by the verse. And sometimes Prabhupada will give several different versions within the verse and purport and maybe surrounding verses. Maybe he'll quote this verse elsewhere and he'll honor a different translation. And you got to look at all that, put that all together, and come up with a cohesive whole that's the best explanation. Do you guys follow that? That's called exegetics, which uses the rules of hermeneutics, how to read a text, how to then draw out, exegetics to draw out the meaning of the text according to... Uh, an objective set of rules and criteria that are laid out for how to best understand a text. Do you guys follow this? What we're seeing here is the beginning of Krishna's argument for monotheism over polytheism. This is the argument of modern day Vaishnavism versus Shaivism and Shaktiism. This is the argument of Judaism versus Babylon. Egyptian or Babylonian religion. This is the argument of Christianity against paganism. This is the argument within paganism of Zeus as a supreme being versus all the gods being equal. This is the argument for one singularity in physics. One simple explanation that accomplishes everything. That does away with the need for many, many different explanations. One explanation that can, that can house them all, a grand unified field theory. Interestingly, in the worship of Vishnu in the old Veda, Vishnu is prayed to differently. All the gods have said you are supreme, but Vishnu is worshipped with bhakti even in the old Veda. Is worship not expecting anything in return. <coughs> even in the old Veda. And so the idea that Vishnu was different, that Vishnu was truly God, a God for shudha bhaktas, for pure devotees, for devotees who wanted nothing, for desireless devotion, that's there even in the old Veda. You got to look for it carefully. You can't just count up how many times Vishnu is prayed to. You have to look at the quality of those prayers. You can't even merely say, is he worship as being supreme? Why doesn't that help us? Hidden? There's other, there's other, other gods, right? you know, that time they That's right. Everybody gets worshipped as, as if they're the best friend, as if they're the uncle, as if they're the aunt, right? And, but there's a difference in the nature of the devotion and the selflessness of the devotion, which distinguishes Vishnu from all the other Vedic deities, even in the beginning. funny cultures along with their deities but the deities actually were in the game so the deities would appear in the game so you could the deities would appear within your game and the, the person who was in charge of the, the game called the dungeon master and they would then bring deities into the game at various points and depending on the deity you were devoted to then you would you know get favors or boons from that deity Vishnu showed up. They had a section on Hinduism, which seems insane to me. Like, how can they have a section on Islam or Christianity? It's, it's like, you know, or Buddhism. It seems ridiculous to me that they would introduce, Ve you know, Vedic deities or Hindu deities into a role-playing game. Super offensive. Um, but anyway, they got away with it. This was back in the day when, you know, it was back in the day when you get away with that kind of stuff. Um, so Vishnu was the only deity in the whole book where it said he can never be killed. <laughs> and if like, you fight with him and you appear to win, he'll just disappear. But like, he, he's unkillable. And if you, you know, if, if, you know, 
if his devotees cry out to him, there's a chance he'll show up and save them. So they got some elements of the old Vedic conception of Vishnu and how Vishnu was distinct from all the other gods in the Hindu pantheon. In fact, all the other gods in every other polytheistic tradition in the world in that we were actually talking about the Supreme Lord. Even in that book, they figured it out. We didn't nearly deal with what I want to deal with today. What Krishna's going to do next, he's going to segue back into these arguments about karma and how you can live in this world but not be of this world. So he dipped into the theology and he dips back into the Buddhist, pre-Buddhist, Stoic type teachings. And you get this interplay where it's not either or, you actually get both. It's a very complete worldview where you get all the benefits of an eternal devotion to a deity and all the great lessons that you would get from Stoicism or Buddhism or, or some sort of transcendental philosophy. And normally, you know, those two things are totally separate. Christianity is just so cheesy when it comes to philosophy and lifestyle and, and stoicism and all this great stuff. They almost view it of the, of the devil and you've got to go to McDonald's you know, every other day and, and, you know, and be obese and, and be super low class and judgmental of other people with you know, you know, beef, beef fat dripping down your beard, you know, and you're stained shirt in a trailer park or whatever. And they have this like this whole like repulsive version of Christianity which is so devoid of this perennial philosophy that's just attractive and shows up all over the world doing your duty but not being attached to the results and being stoic and being equipoised and success and failure and victory and defeat and living according to a higher principle of having elements of your character that, that, that stand no matter what the surrounding world does to you and staying the course and letting that be a reward in itself and not trying to change the things you can't change in the world but changing yourself and realizing that 90% of it's perspective and that you can grow in any circumstance you can exist like a lotus flower in the mud but being untainted by the mud and that no one ever becomes truly corrupt and everybody has a chance and there's no there's no uh, sinner without a future or saint without a past and it's kind of like cool stuff that you find in any halfway thought through philosophy these principles of detachment and non-materialism. Even like even your grandfather's supposed to know. Even your grandmother's supposed to figure out. They be, they, they're almost a, a village wisdom that's there where the older generation who has evaporated their lust and greed then bequeaths this, this voice of depth and profundity to the, to the next generation down, or maybe the two, two generations down. So much of that's lacking in mainstream Christianity, unfortunately. Amazingly, it's there in mainstream Hinduism still. You talk to your average taxi driver in India, and he'll spout a little bit of Stoic philosophy at you from the Gita. It's not that those things didn't exist in Christianity. They had a whole monastic tradition they have a whole renunciate ascetic tradition. It's just somehow it didn't survive you know, into, the, into the mainstream. The philokalia and stuff like that didn't make it into the modern day. It was there. Um, la, la noche oscura del alma, stuff like that. You find it cropping up at various points in the history of Christianity. It just somehow didn't make it into the mainstream for, you know, whatever that is, 2.8 billion or 2.9 billion of the 3 billion Christians in the world. Um, but it's still very much there in Hinduism. And there's a reason for that, because when you look at a text like the Gita, they just side-by-side it. You get a little theology, supreme being, and then Krishna's going to go right back into what is karma, what is a karma, what is v-karma. What is good acts, forbidden acts, and inaction? You have to learn to see inaction within action and action within inaction. And if you have the right consciousness, then the results of your actions are burned up in the action itself. And they have all this cool stuff that's almost koanic and worthy of it. It's just about to be espoused. And you should act, but act like as the ancients did, desiring liberation without being attached to the results. And so Krishna just segues right back into that lesson. 
and uses himself as an example. I created the whole world, and yet I am unattached. Therefore, you can do your duty, but not be attached. And so there's this nice, really nice juxtapositioning and integrating of a stoic, detached, profound lifestyle and mindset and it just it just marries together beautifully with theism, intense theism, eternal theism, fundamental bhakti, high bhakti, real bhakti, perennial bhakti. And it's it's a beautiful marriage. Do you guys follow that? So we didn't get to... Well, I wanted to show you that. I wanted to show you the, the jump from theology to stoicism and how Krishna... It's just really deft in how he does it. And he's just wafting back and forth. And, you know, he's working on your cognitive and working on your behavioral and back to cognitive and back to behavioral. And it's really, you know, really cool therapeutic process where Krishna's reframing the way you view the world and then giving you some life lessons you can apply and then back to reframing a little bit more nuance and back to some really cool life lessons and it's just going back and forth like I want to demonstrate that we only got to one verse so I'm just letting you know what we'll be covering next week um, I think that's it thank you very much IGTV you guys want to give me some feedback yeah